The man got up and took off his prison uniform, ripped off the wires on the wall and charged his body to help him regain his superpower to control electricity. An electric shock sent the prison guard in front of him into the air. And then the man controlled the electric current to destroy the prison's electrical system. The superpowers held here immediately rioted, followed by chaos in the prison. Next, let's briefly introduce the background of the story. The story takes place in a future world where war is frequent. Some countries even used nuclear weapons, which led to the deaths of billions of people from nuclear radiation syndrome. And nature has also been irreparably damaged. Some of them under radiation genetic mutation, having accidentally obtained a variety of superpowers. In order to plunder resources, the superpowered people began to use their abilities to rob banks and cause various riots. The U.S. government, in order to suppress this army, also set up a super prison to hold these criminals. Late one night, in an underground parking lot, a group of superpowered people were causing trouble when a strong man suddenly appeared holding a double gun in his hand, and started a massacre against them. This strong man is called Jack, and although he is not a superhero, he is a superhero's nightmare. A few years ago, Jack's daughter died at the hands of superpowers, so for the past few years, Jack has been slaughtering superpowered people to avenge his daughter. It is expected that by now, Jack has killed more than 40 superpowers. Of course, the gentleman in front of us tonight will not escape death after all. After the battle, the police arrived at the scene and arrested Jack, faced with the vicious Jack. The police sent him directly to the super prison, and this is exactly what Jack wanted. He wanted to kill people here. Among the prisoners sent with Jack was a boy named Dias. His ability is to share emotions and feel the pain of those around him. Dias did not hurt anyone but was wrongly accused of going to prison, so he felt very stifled. Superpowered people sent to prison are put in ankle cuffs which can suppress their superpowers to prevent riots. The boss of this prison is the warden in front of him. He is very sinister, likes money, and uses violence against the prisoners below. Recently, the warden is retiring, and he wants to scavenge some money from the inmates before he leaves. The warden targets the prisoner. Bruce, who is a criminal, Bruce's superpower is to control anything with his mind, including the human brain and he later uses this power to steal billions of dollars. Because a criminal like Bruce has no chance of getting parole, the prison warden says. As long as Bruce transfers the money to himself, he promised that the next warden would not look for any trouble when he arrived and would keep the current special care. Bruce did not agree on the spot, but he was mentally calculating his escape plan. On the other hand, Jack fought with a fellow inmate as soon as he arrived at the prison. The man's name is Jim and his brother was killed by Jack. The two of them fought with each other as enemies. In the absence of superpowers, Jim's ability is clearly inferior to Jack's. And on the other hand, a violent beating. Only when he was dying did a prison guard step in to stop it and send the two to the infirmary for treatment. The guards loved this scene because it added a touch of fun to a tedious life. In the infirmary, after examining them, Mary, the beautiful doctor, turned her head and headed inside. She was ready to psychologically treat Bruce when, to her surprise, Jack came in right behind him. As soon as he saw Bruce, he recognized him as a vicious criminal. Jack was instantly furious and tried to kill him. Jack first strangled Mary next to him and then tried to do it to Bruce. At the critical moment, Diaz, who was cleaning the infirmary, heard the commotion. He rushes in and takes him down with a dive holding him firmly in place until the guards arrive. Bruce's respect and affection were earned by Diaz's actions. Bruce, as the absolute king of the inmates, naturally had a group of minions under him, and they began to take good care of Diaz. At this point, a fellow inmate named Gordon comes forward to talk to Diaz and make friends with him. Through this conversation, we learn that Gordon was here at the beginning of the Supermax prison. For all these years, Gordon has been applying for parole. But unfortunately, each time it has not been passed. In fact, it is not difficult to see here that the U.S. government's treatment of superpowered people has always been an unfair treatment. They simply do not have the possibility of parole. Although Gordon knew this, he still had illusions and prayed that his next parole would be successful. Unfortunately, the result was the same, and his parole application was denied again. Gordon became disillusioned and became depressed from that point on. Bruce is continuing to prepare his escape plan. That day, at lunchtime, Bruce's assistant handed Gordon an iron object. Gordon used it to unlock his ankle cuffs, then took off his prison uniform, ripped off the wire to recharge his body, regained his superpower, and destroyed the prison's electrical system. Apparently, 
Gordon has joined Bruce's men, becoming his right-hand man on the way out of prison. With the destruction of the electrical system, the prisoners acted as if they had received a signal, and the prison began to riot. Of course, the damage to the electrical system does not affect the use of ankle cuffs. This is just a move made by Bruce. As for the use of this move, it will be described later. Soon, the warden instructed the deputy warden to immediately start the backup motor to restore the electrical system. The next second, the cranky prisoners were electrocuted by the ankle cuffs, all of them dead, and were reincarcerated back to the prison. At that moment, Gordon came to the infirmary, looking out the window at the free world. His face showed unstoppable sadness. Seeing the riot suppressed, he realized that there was no escape. Just then, a female prison guard arrived to punch Gordon down. Then, she received the order to kill Gordon. Just like that, the female prison guards are intolerant, but the order is hard to resist. She still punched Gordon again and again in the face until there was no movement. As things unfolded, the warden realized that the riot was probably Bruce preparing for the escape. He saw Diaz getting close to the other man and thought there was something secret between them. So he approached him and tried to make a deal. Unfortunately, Diaz really does not know anything. Bruce only asked him to listen to his own words, and he was only obedient to get out. Seeing no useful clues from Diaz here, the warden went straight to Bruce, warned him not to think about escaping and that the best option is to work honestly with himself. Bruce changed his attitude and agreed to cooperate with the warden. He needs time to transfer money as well as the network, which needs to be provided by the warden. The latter, upon hearing this, casually agreed to do so. The guards went down to the basement to check the wiring that had been damaged by Gordon, then had the staff make repairs while the prison's systems were completely updated. In the meantime, the super prison returns to its usual life. With only Bruce silently carrying out his plans, he used the tablet computer provided by the warden to create a virus program to prepare for the jailbreak. Jack tattooed a cross on his face and continued to look for trouble with Jim. But for some reason, Jim is clearly unwilling to pick up on him. Time passes and comes to the day of the warden's retirement. He came to the office with champagne and high spirits. And after a simple cleanup, he found Bruce, took out his tablet computer, and asked the other party to transfer money to his account. Bruce was very cooperative, picked up the tablet and began to transfer funds. The warden was very happy, but did not know that Bruce was transferring money while planting his own virus program in the system. Soon, under the effect of the virus program, the prisoner's ankle cuffs lose their effect, they collectively regain their superpowers, and the prison riots instantly. He was notified in advance and went to the infirmary to hide, but he still sensed the pain of other escapees, thanks to the beautiful doctor who comforted him in time. He was able to ease his pain. The prisoners, who had regained their superpowers, let themselves go completely and were in a mess. I thought the final superpower showdown would be great, and I was disappointed to see the money start to burn. The special effects of the battle of the superpowers are almost zero. There is not the slightest point to watch. On the other hand, the warden of the prison received a call and learned that there was chaos outside. I was immediately ready to go out to command, but found that the prison door had long been Bruce locked. At this time, the warden still does not know that he is Bruce's escape plan in the most important part. Outside the prison, the prison guards gradually lose their ability to support it. Call the deputy warden to find a solution. The deputy warden said that the entire system was built on a generator, and that restarting the generator would reconnect the ankle cuff system. Hearing this, prison guard Alan rushed to the basement and prepared to restart the generator. Unexpectedly, a superpowered man caught up with him at that moment and wrestled with Alan to stop him from restarting. The two sides fought back and forth, and the fight was unbearable. After all, a superpowered person is a superpowered person, and Alan, as an ordinary person, is no match for him, so he is overwhelmed by the fight. At the critical moment, Alan noticed a pipe on the side. He smashed it open, and a large amount of hot air instantly gushed out of it, and the superpowered man was scalded to death. Meanwhile, the warden, who had finished calling for backup, sat relaxed in front of Bruce, holding his tablet and smiling at the amount in his account. At this point, Bruce suddenly snapped. He has a skill that no one else knows about. That is, the exchange of brains. That's right. Bruce did all this to exchange brain consciousness with the warden. With the help of his body, to open a new life, Bruce knows that he cannot get out. There is only one way to get free. Before, Bruce let Gordon destroy the power system just so he could have the opportunity to plant a virus program into the system when he fixed the update. It turns out that Gordon was cannon fodder all along. When the warden figured it all out, 
It was too late. Bruce has used his superpowers to complete his plan to swap consciousness with the warden. Bruce then knocked out the warden with a punch. And Alan's side managed to activate the generator. And the shackle system was restored. The warden then took control of the scene. Electrocuted all the prisoners and took them back to their cells. Soon after, Bruce's cell door was opened. Bruce struts out, then turns around and instructs the guards to send Bruce to a small dark room and never let him out. The film ends with Bruce getting his life back while also getting Diaz and his assistant out of jail. From the beginning, he had told the two men not to join the riot. The only way to have a chance at parole. In this way, Bruce borrowed the warden's body to start a new life. And that's where the story ends. Corrective Measures is a sci-fi film that was recently released. Although the film's plot is slightly confusing and also full of holes, since it is likely to be Bruce Willis's last film, we recommend watching the original film.